Hello and welcome to this live broadcast of the program Green is Gold, a show proudly brought to you by Zimpapers Television Network ZTN in partnership with Hivos through the Green and Inclusive Energy Initiative, uh, which seeks to help alleviate the energy poverty situation in Southern Africa. I'm Blessing Munati. Now, this program is the second in a series that will focus on the importance of Zimbabwe transitioning to the use of renewable energy and looks at opportunities arising, especially for the marginalized groups within this transition. Now, today we will be focusing on the youth engagement in the renewable energy value chain and Africa's future depends on product, uh, productively harnessing the power of its youth uh, to stimulate inclusive green growth. This not only needs to be a priority for governments in the region, but is also a key component of regional and international development strategies, including, of course, African Union's Agenda 2063 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Now, the clean energy sector has high potential to create jobs and also sustainable livelihoods for African youth. And uh, to further explore today's topic, I'm joined in studio by two guests whom I'm going to ask to kindly introduce themselves, uh, starting, of course, with a lovely lady in the house. Okay, thanks, Blessing, for having me here. My name is Amanda Chennai Makombe. Um, I'm a youth advocate in Zimbabwe and in the region for green energy. I advocate for the use of renewable and clean energy. I've been working around uh, clean energy with young people and trying to recruit as much as possible. We call them green rangers. When, when you talk to young people, we call them green rangers. So we're trying by all means to accommodate and recruit more green rangers in Zimbabwe, in SADC, and in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Uh, sir. Good morning, Blessing. Good morning, viewers. My name is uh, Phil Mudawano. I'm representing Action 24, a non-governmental organization which uh, deals with uh, renewable energy and climate change. Mm -hmm. I am also representing the Gender Energy Network in Zimbabwe, which also looks into renewable energy issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Phil, and uh, welcome. Now, feel free to engage us uh, during the course of the show through our social media platforms. That's on Facebook, Zim Papers TV Network, also on YouTube, ZTN. On our Twitter, our handle is at ZTN News. Now, our producers are on standby to forward your questions to our panelists. Now, Amanda, just to get the ball rolling, uh, can you highlight more, um, you know, of your advocacy efforts? What have you been doing with the Green Rangers uh, to try and conscientize the youth? Okay, um, we, we, we actually realized, okay, after, let me give you a big, a brief background of how this came about. He was actually had a training program for mm -hmm. the youth in East Africa, Southern Africa, and uh, Central Africa. So they called in for proposals and they called in for applications. And I was one of the young people that had a Zimbabwean dream to make sure that uh, young people have clean access to renewable and clean access to af affordable energy. So we, we actually realized that there the, are not a lot of young people involved in, in green energy. So we wanted to start co conversations around green energy, what it means, how, how do we go about it, projects. So to kickstart the conversation, I, I've been working hand in glove with Hivos, uh, using my, my Twitter handle, trying to make sure that I go to workshops, I attend each and every event where we find young people, working hand in glove with tertiary in institutions, the UZ, um, CART, and close to each and every tertiary institution in Zimbabwe, including mm -hmm. Catholic University in Zimbabwe. So we're trying to accommodate and both the peop young people in and out of school so that no one is left behind. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work around, start a conversation around green energy. What, is, what, does, it, what does it mean to, to say green energy? Because I feel we felt green energy has, has a lot to do with technical jargons. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to re actually remove that barrier to actually make sure that young people are free to ask about green energy and they don't see it as a, as a monster or just a dragon or jargon, but mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. familiarize with green energy. Mm -hmm. Now, Phil, uh, just as Amanda is, is highlighting, that it seems there is need to try and demystify, uh, you know, some of the misconceptions that might be around uh, green energy. Looking at the region, uh, what has been the trend uh, of the participation of the youths and what is Zimbabwe's status in terms of, uh, you know, climate change and adapting renewable energy? Okay. Uh, <coughs> thank you. I will also want to start by giving... Um, a background yeah, of how Action 24 uh, began the, the program of, uh, under the, the, the renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So 
in uh, five years ago, uh, Action24 partnered with uh, EVOS in a, prog in a uh, strat strategic partnership program, uh, which is called uh, Green and Inclusive Energy Program. It was a five-year program with uh, five partners. So the program was mainly dealing on uh, community engagement from different levels. And Action24, as a youth-based organization, we came in um, leading the, thel the thematic area of, uh, of youth and renewable energy. So we were trying to lobby and advocate uh, the government on uh, renewable el energy issues, uh, trying to demystify, uh, trying to send the message out there, trying to make sure that youth take part in this renewable energy discourse as we are trying to transition into a green economy, taking into consideration the, the SDG goals, particularly goal number seven, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which uh, focuses on um, uh, ensuring access uh, to, re to affordable, uh, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Mm -hmm. Now, Amanda, in, in your line of work, obviously you, you're quite active in trying to get down to the grassroots. Uh, do we have robust structures to actually disseminate information and ensure that you know, uh, youths are conscientized regarding opportunities that are available in the renewable energy sector? Well, I feel that uh, structures are there, but more needs to be done because there might be structures, but then when it comes to implementation of of the models of how the information gets to the people, you realize most of the people within the rural areas, within the peri-urban setups, do not have access to green energy information projects on green energy or any probably basic information on what actually green energy is. So I feel m more needs to be done by, it's, I feel it's a collective responsibility for the government and for those in civil sector to actually wake and make sure that people have a sensitization. People, in quotes, our target group, young people, mm -hmm. the youth have what, know actually what it means when we talk about green energy, when we talk about renewable energy. I feel a lot needs to be done. We, we, we are not yet there, and we're not even within the middle, so I feel we're still lagging behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Phil, um, looking at the energy value chain itself, um, which categories offer short and long-term um, opportunities, especially for the youth, be it employment or investment? Okay. <coughs> Um, looking at the okay, I will start by saying uh, you know, energy is the is is, is a golden is a, is a golden thread mm -hmm. which connects uh, economic growth, social equity, and also environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. So when you are looking at uh, renewable energy value chain, there are a lot of uh, opportunities which it comes with. Uh, I still remember when I was making a point in one of our green discussions at a certain university, I was saying 20 years ago, if uh, you look in the IT sector, mm -hmm. a lot of people ventured into IT sector when uh, having a cell phone was uh, something which looked like an achievement. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, we didn't realize that if someone is a cell phone and a laptop, these things will need energy at some point. Mm -hmm. So having a lot of cell phones and a lot of computers have left a deficit, which is an opportunity for young people now mm -hmm. to venture into, provide, into providing that energy which we need for the gadgets in this developed world we are in. Right now a lot of viewers are seeing us today on their cell phones, not necessarily on a domestic home a TV set. Mm -hmm. So you realize that uh, the opportunities in the renewable energy for, for the youth are there. And the youth uh, have got the creativity and the innovation to move this green agenda. Mm -hmm.
Now, you, you mentioned a very, a very key point there because I, I was going to mention the dynamic nature of the youth themselves in their very nature. They're innovative and um, you know, they, they can also take part um, into adequately tapping into the resources of um, you know, the renewables. But you mentioned a very key area in terms of technology. The digital era is yes. upon us. Yes. Um, Amanda, does this give the youths any leverage really um, um, to say that uh, you know we've got renewable products uh, progressing um, technology wise and uh, towards energy efficient tools are we you know able to actually leverage on this as the youth well um, speaking on behalf of all the youths in Zimbabwe I feel that since uh, about 82 percent of young people have access to a smartphone it gives us a leverage to work on renewable energy because it's a digital era but however, a lot needs to be done because we're not only looking at cell phones because we also look at access to information. We also have to look at things like data, technical expertise. Of course, we have the leverage to, to access information from, from our cell phones, but we actually don't have the technical expertise on how, how to do that. Okay. Now, uh, definitely we do have a case that I, I will want us to look at, um, you know, Phil, um, yes. and then maybe we can, we can reconvene after that. Takudzo um, Chambak, we caught up with, uh, you know, the Soul Gas co-founder, um, that's Tafadzo Mundicha, um, just to show that, you know, there are opportuni opportunities that are out there waiting for the youths to explore. Let's just take a look at this clip. Uh, to the fellow young men and women out there, the youths of this nation. You see, the thing about uh, entrepreneurship, it's basically about identifying uh, a gap that's in the market. In, in, in my case, uh, I looked at the import bill and I looked at um, the ridiculous amounts of money that, are, that we're paying to um, ESCOM, to, to Kahura Basa uh, in terms of importing power. And I said, look, there's an opportunity here. Um, when you want to do anything or something as an entrepreneur, what you need to look at is, uh, number one, you're not, going, you're not always going to find or come across ideas. You need to look at an idea, do your research properly, and invest time and energy. Put your skin in the game in terms of um, doing the pre-development and development phase of, 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 of whatever idea that you have to such an extent that when there would be investors come on board, you've, you've got something of value, your interests are, are, are alignable to, 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 to their interests. So um, also uh, I, I would urge uh, young, young people to, to, to invest in ideas that are scalable. What we're doing here is we're starting off with a, with a 5 megawatt solar power plant, but eventually, look, it's the same concept, whether it's a 1 megawatt or it's a 100 megawatt, it's all about capacity. We've created capacity in terms of funding a 5 megawatt. Now, when we then bring in the would-be investors, we're no, we're no longer a greenfield, we're a brownfield. We are, we, are th we are guys that are actually in the field operating, uh, running a power plant. So it's now a matter of just saying, okay, guys, uh, we want to create multiple 5 megawatts by, by 20 you know, hence you've got your 100 megawatts. The, the idea is scalable. We can take it across the country and actually it will, it will blossom and it will, it will, it will, it will alleviate uh, the, the, the shortages that, we, that we're currently facing in terms of power and in terms of forex as a nation. Right. Uh... No, guys, we just saw the um, action giving, uh, you know, uh, results. Uh, five megawatt plant fully registered with the Zimbabwe Energy Regulatory Authority. These guys are making headway also in Chiredzi um, for a 10 megawatt uh, solar plant as well. Any comments you can take? <laughs> okay, that is amazing. From a young person to a young person, that is amazing. It, it's fabulous, it's worth, it's inspiring. But I also felt there were no young women <laughs> for the plant. I think we should also engage young women and girls doing this major plan, this major uh, project, uh, but I feel it's a great project. It's a mm -hmm. great initiative. Now, Phil, uh, obviously, uh, as uh, you know, Tafadzwa was uh, giving us um, his background there. He's just 32 years old, and mm -hmm. he's the chief financial officer. He's also the mm -hmm. co-founder. Looking at our policies uh, towards clean energy, um, are they inclusive? And how do we factor the youth to be more, um, you know, active within the renewables? Okay. Yeah. Uh, to begin with, that uh, project is impressive, especially coming from a young person. Uh, I would want to applaud the government 
for drafting and uh, coming up with the recently launched uh, renewable energy policy and the biofuels policy, which are in their still in their infants. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were launched in uh, in February. Mm -hmm. So now to say that uh, we don't have the supporting policy uh, will be an understatement. But now the policy is there. Mm -hmm. Like uh, she was saying that having a policy is okay and uh, it's a very good thing which can uh, fuel uh, the, this um, movement and transitioning into a green economy. But now, having a policy is not the means to an end. Mm -hmm. It has to be the starting point. It's Maybe yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. I can say it's a step in a good direction. Mm -hmm. But we also have to look now into implementation. Uh, if you further interrogate uh, Takuzwa, he will tell you uh, in implementation of uh, his projects and trying to scale up, you will face some impediments, mm -hmm. which uh, I think the policy, which was, uh, which I think after reading it, it's uh, it's inclusive. It uh, it has got uh, it tries to 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 to, to cater for, for gender issues. It tries to include uh, young people. During the implementation stage, stage, young people should also take a very uh, important part in participating, mm -hmm. not only as end users of the technologies, but also as the producers, like what we have uh, seen uh, Takuza doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked um, one point that he, he stressed, the issue on um, when he was uh, trying to highlight the point that there are some there are some problems mm -hmm. which makes it uh, difficult for them to upscale, like you're saying that they want to they are doing a project in Chiriz. They would also want to do another project maybe in Chivi or in Gutu. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there are other things that uh, needs to be loosened up, mm -hmm. especially on other policies. I will give an example of. The issue of acquiring land for land. them to do their projects. Mm -hmm. You see, this type of uh, project that we are saying it needs a lot of land. So you'd see if our policies are not in sync with each other, our national policies are not in sync. It will be difficult for them to uh, establish their plans mm -hmm. due to failing to acquire enough land, maybe enough land in time for them to to do their projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Now, Amanda did highlight the issue of, uh, you know, the girl child. And, yes. um, you know, within the youth sphere, we do have the girl child and uh, in significant numbers as well. Apart from the policy, um, do we have actionables that, uh, you know, point to deliberate effort to also empower the girl child? Yeah, <coughs> uh, on, this, uh, on, this, on this question, I will refer to our program the Green and Inclusive Energy Program. Mm -hmm. uh, deliberately, uh, the program has uh, revived the Gender and Energy Network, mm -hmm. which deliberately caters for the girl child. Not necessarily the girl child alone, but also other vulnerable groups, which involve the pe people living with disability, the elderly, and women. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, within this network, we try to bring in different stakeholders, different CSOs, uh, journalists, so that they capture issues around uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. uh, with the coming in of the policy, the renewable energy policy, which also stresses the point of recognizing uh, gender issues and trying to balance between the gender imbalances which uh, have been there before mm -hmm. and to maybe uh, break some of the patriarchal uh, ideologies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was uh, for quite a long time uh, putting the girl child on a disadvantage mm -hmm. as compared to their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Now, Amanda, what, what is the extent of um, you know, the energy uh, poverty and is it affecting the youths in a direct or indirect way? Well, it's affecting the youth both in a direct and indirect way because let us look at, okay, fine, I can give like UN statistics, UN women statistics on, 
on how young people have died. Mm -hmm. They say that eight, like 60% of the women that died uh, due to prematurely due to uh, indoors air pollution uh, was 60%. Like 60% of 14 million, which is a very big number. And among those 14 million, about 38% uh, are young people, of which 38% is, a, is, a, is, a, is a quite a big number significant. For, for a significant number for, for young people. I feel uh, because of lack of access to clean and renewable, to access to clean and affordable energy, young people are hindered progress because we, we look at the issues of uh, productive use of energy. People want to do projects, they want to raise chickens, they want to do uh, projects within their rural homes, within their homes. So it's, it's, it's a hindrance for young people and it's also a, a, a leave, let me say a, a slow leverage on how they progress and uh, contribute to the whatever general gross productive economy of, of our state mm -hmm. and, and nation. Mm -hmm. Now, Phil, as, as uh, Tafazo was giving us his, his contribution there, I, I thought of uh, most independent power producers uh, are struggling with finance. It's obviously one common barrier. Uh, we will look at uh, the other barriers later on, but the issue of finance, we've seen you know, a change in policy um, that revolves around finance over the past year. Has this affected uh, you know, some of the projects that could have uh, come up in the in the sphere of renewable energy. Yeah, of course. Uh, you see, the sphere of uh, renewable energy is uh, is of high costs. Uh, it's, it's a high cost uh, type of uh, the, the, the the renewable energy projects. The high cost type of projects. If you if you can if you can um, realize. So independent power producers has been affected mm -hmm. immensely with. Uh, the current economic situation, the policy inconsistency, uh, moving away from the US dollar going to and all the back and forth, they affects their projects. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at these independent power producers, most of them, they rely with partnership with outside investors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of which uh, outside investors are sensitive, very sensitive to policies mm -hmm. and uh, policy consistency. So you realize oh, if our policies are, ca are, are changing here and there, it affects them. However, the recently launched a renewable energy policy tried to, to look into that, mm -hmm. especially on the issue of uh, financing. It's trying to call for funding from government, from domestic banks, so that at least flows of uh, funding can come in uh, in different ways, whether they come as grants, whether they come as uh, loans, and also trying to encourage our domestic banks to provide for loans, mm -hmm. yes, which are a little bit, uh, uh, which are a little bit uh, shortened, flexible, uh, mm -hmm. flexible with uh, shortened payback periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that will encourage our independent power producers to venture into renewable energy. Mm -hmm. The program is uh, Green as Gold, uh, brought to you by Hivos in, uh, in line with their Green and Inclusive Energy Initiative. Of course, we will be looking at uh, other aspects, uh, barriers uh, to investment within the renewables uh, sector and uh, also the contribution of the youths uh, when it comes to uh, the curriculum and uh, also development of technology. All that is coming up uh, shortly after this. Don't go away.
Hello and welcome back to Green as Gold, a program brought to you by ZTN in partnership with the Hevos uh, People Unlimited. Uh, this is in line with a green and inclusive energy initiative. Uh, today we're looking at the youths in renewable energy. Now, Amanda, uh, the issue of uh, potential employment creation for the youths that comes out of the renewable energy, uh, could green jobs be actually a solution to the unemployment problem? Well, mo most definitely. Like, looking with regards to Tafadzo's case, we can see that a lot of young people are being employed by, by other young people, uh, which means that it's, it's, it's a solution. It's already a solution for, for, for the country, not only for the country, even for the region. Uh, I feel that green energy is, is an untapped market. If we can venture into the market and actually penetrate, we could have a lot of young people not being unemployed, a lot of, a lot of young people having something to do, having tangible jobs, and also the economy benefiting, the state at large benefiting from, from this. Mm -hmm. Elfio, I know your organization looks to want to involve the grassroots in, in, in all your programs. Uh, how can the youth participate you know, in re actively reducing the carbon footprint? Yeah, to <coughs> for, for, as, for, as for Action 24, under the Green and Inclusive Energy Program, mm -hmm. we have got uh, what we call the Green Discussions Platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this uh, platform is uh, meant to engage young people in the renewable energy discourse. Mm -hmm. In most cases, we work with uh, youth uh, from the age of uh, 15 to 35, particularly looking at the outside tertiary, the youth which who are outside the tertiary System. education, mm -hmm. yes, and those who are still in university and the uh, tertiary institutions. We work with uh, universities, we work with uh, polytechnic mm -hmm. uh, colleges in trying to in trying to encourage young people to do research, mm -hmm. to venture, to do in a, to come up with their innovative ideas, which can be upscaled mm -hmm. to be big projects, which can also reach commercialization, reach commercialization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we can counter the mm -hmm. problem of uh, unemployment mm -hmm. that we are currently having. In that way, we think it's uh, uh, the first step in trying to reach the, the grassroots because if you go to at an university uh, and engage students in a public lecture mm -hmm. you would have uh, touched young people from different communities mm -hmm. you know in university there are students who come from urban areas there are students who come from rural areas so if you can actually give them this the awareness on uh, renewable energy they can actually go back and mm -hmm. replicate their ideas in mm -hmm. the communities that they come in. So in that way, you would have educated uh, the community. You mm -hmm. would have educated the community. And go uh, further to that, we are trying also to work with the Ministry of Education so that the issues of renewable energy are also embedded in the updated curriculum. new curriculum mm -hmm. so that at least we catch them young. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a difference of someone who will start to hear the word renewable energy at my age and mm -hmm. someone who learned these things when uh, he is still in primary school, going to secondary. Already that person can actually see this is a lucrative industry. Mm -hmm. They can actually work to become renewable energy engineers. Mm -hmm. It's now the packaging of the renewable energy discourse to young people so that they make it, uh, we make it uh, more lucrative. You mm -hmm. know, when you are dealing with young people, this is a sensitive group because when you go to them, the first questions they ask you is, where is the money? Mm -hmm. That's what they want to hear. Where is the money? So you have to package your message so that they see the bigger picture, the opportunities mm -hmm. that come mm -hmm. with the renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, as you were talking there, I thought about uh, you know, the business startups and uh, the incubations. Um, the current efforts towards incubation and innovation, is it sufficient, especially for the renewable energy concepts that are coming up? Yeah, I would say the, uh, the current incubation and um, the finances that are channeled toward the youth for them to develop themselves, mm -hmm. if they are there, they are very little and not sufficient. Mm -hmm. We really need to fund more because you see there are a lot of uh, ideas if you go in universities our first discussion we engaged 
Arari Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. That was our first call in 2017, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. We went there to, for a green discussion. They came up with a lot of uh, innovative ideas to such an extent that some of them, they were showing us their research projects. They do at, uh, f or at final level. Mm -hmm. They were showing us those type of, of projects. But because there are no funds, there is no one uh, following up on those projects. Those projects are going to waste. It's mm -hmm. just for someone to complete the university and just furnish them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Amanda, the, is there equal opportunity uh, when it comes into tapping into you know the potential of renewable energy? Looking at um, the youths in the urban area and the youths in the marginalized areas. Well, um, I feel I feel privilege comes first to youths within urban areas. As you have spoken before, that usually when you go to university set setups, mm -hmm. which means they're already within an institution, but if you don't go to the grassroots to where the, actually the young people are, because you have some people, some young people mm -hmm. who are not enrolled at any tertiary, in tertiary institution or enrolled at any educational institution, but they're just home. They have the ideas, they have the knowledge. They have the potential, but because they're just idle at home and they have no access, they, there's no personal contact between sensitization and and the and the potential uh, potential young person who has the the capacity. Mm -hmm. So I feel that there's we need to bridge the gap because people in young people in urban areas they have have I can call it uh, privilege access maybe. access mm -hmm. privilege. Was we look at data, we look at interaction, we look at exposure. Information. Even. Information mm -hmm. is all at their disposal. But when someone is within a marginal, marginalized space in mm -hmm. rural areas, they have a lot going on to think of, okay, fine, how can I access the data? They are the ones who are like the end consumers. Mm -hmm. The information must be targeted directly to them, not as in you, they have to go to YouTube, go to WhatsApp, or, you know, it's there's a gap. I feel there's a gap that needs mm -hmm. bridging. Now, obviously, uh, Amanda raises a, a very key point. The quality and reach of our innovation and support systems, is it sufficient? I know you wanted to add on to what she was saying. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to add on to, to what she was saying with a bit of some statistics, mm -hmm. which shows that 87% uh, of Zimbabwe's population uh, lives in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And 13% of the people in uh, rural areas have got access to electricity, to electricity mm -hmm. which is quite disturbing looking at uh, the young people who live in these marginalized communities. What it means is they don't have the data, they don't have the information, uh, they don't have uh, access to some of the projects, even like what she was saying. Mm -hmm. If you want to look at uh, the composition of for uh, the people who applied for the opportunity that she, she gets. Most of them, if not more mm -hmm. than 95%, were from urban areas. But it doesn't necessarily mean we don't have vibrant young people mm -hmm. in the we have got a lot of potential mm -hmm. in the in the rural areas. So how do we how do we bridge this gap in the in the short to medium term? Yeah. So in the short to medium term to bridge this gap, there is need for robust awareness programs mm -hmm. which reach the young people. E, we try to change the way we interact with uh, these young people. If we can now e, in come up with type of e, with, uh, with uh, renewable energy campaigns mm -hmm. in rural areas so that we really go in the deep areas and try to campaign, try to, to sensitize people. And if even if it means we go there with um, some video clips of uh, Takuzwa there mm -hmm. to show the young people that there's a potential in renewable energy, give them the necessary information for them to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. Even if we can actually come within their community, if in their communities to come up with uh, community hubs which specifically looks mm -hmm. at uh, renewable energy so mm -hmm. that even those young people who are in the who are in who are out of uh, university or who even who don't have uh, that um, uh, academic qualifications mm -hmm. to qualify to be in university are okay, well catered for mm -hmm. in the renewable energy mm -hmm. space. Which which subsectors of, of renewable energy? Because I know that there's quite a, a huge offering. Um, can we push forward uh, or can we prioritize 
and easily you know disseminate to the less developed parts of the country yeah you know if you come to a layman and uh, talk of renewable energy or just to think of solar, solar energy mm -hmm. everyone else thinks yeah of we're mm. still with a uh, video clip that we uh, we have just shown the mm -hmm. if you are talking of from where you're talking to someone you will just think but there are a lot uh, there is uh, the biogas mm -hmm. uh, the renewable energy fund which is the government agents I understand at some point there it uh, um, program which was called the national biogas program mm -hmm. which was also aiming at uh, rural areas mm -hmm. which is a very uh, lucrative mm -hmm. uh, it's very practical it's mm -hmm. very practical mm -hmm. and it can actually employ a mm -hmm. lot of young people mm -hmm. because they actually train in that program they actually train Mansons mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who can actually build and you know if uh, in a rural setup people are trained and it's not too expensive mm -hmm. for someone to install a biogas uh, digester in mm -hmm. their raw setup. And most of the raw setups in, um, in Zimbabwe, they have got the feed. Most mm -hmm. of them, they have got cattle. Most of them, they have got blade toilets, which can actually feed the, mm. the biogas. Bio yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are also other subsectors of renewable energy, which are like the um, wind energy, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and uh, microgrids. Mm -hmm which can actually improve their lifestyles, which mm -hmm. can actually improve their, their energy access mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the new now, now, Amanda, your advocacy efforts, uh, just picking from what Phil is saying, uh, in trying to demystify the misconception and looking at, at, at uh, focusing rather on just solar, uh, how have your advocacy efforts been in trying to you know, increase the awareness in, in as far as the range uh, of the different offerings are concerned? Okay, so we actually have engaged young people not only from the rural areas but also from tertiary institutions mm -hmm. so that they can be an osmosis of information between those that, know, that have like the information to those who don't have the information. Mm -hmm. Also, I've engaged some of the young people that we went with to, with to Arusha who are quite doing quite well, those that are doing cook stores here in Zimbabwe, those that are doing briquettes, so that people can actually see how, how which field they would like to tape in and actually say, okay, fine, I want that, or oh, like, we can do that, so that people are not only limited, so that people don't only limit their mobility to solar and, and hydro, but mm -hmm. also invest in other potential, mm -hmm. potential spaces. Mm -hmm. no, no, Phil, if, if we look at um, you know, investment in the uh, productive uh, sector, of uh, renewable energy. Uh, what are the opportunities that are there uh, for us, the youths, to actually advance in the you know productive sectors? You talked about wind, and I was thinking already about water pumps. Um, you know, what are some of the opportunities that are there in the productive side of renewables? Okay, so to begin with, the first opportunity comes in from the fact that already our grid electricity is not enough. Our grid electricity is not enough. And there's a huge gap on energy access, mm -hmm. which if young people can actually bridge that gap through innovative ideas, imagine if can someone can come with, a, with his or a model mm -hmm. which uh, supplies a very big industry, which is uh, being affected with uh, power cuts. Already that person can realize a lot of profit because this is on demand. The issue is on the demand side. Mm -hmm. The demand side is not uh, balanced and it's not enough. So you'd realize if young people can tap into that sector and to uh, bridge the inadequacy of for energy within the energy sector, that is the way there's a huge potential for, 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 for young people. The other opportunities for young people, they can actually become producers of uh, uh, renewable energy technologies, renewable energy, renewable energy components. You realize most of the components, solar components, we are importing them from other countries. We are importing from South Africa, we are importing from Germany, we are importing from Netherlands. Are they that sophisticated? They are not too sophisticated, mm -hmm. but the problem comes back to financial backup. Mm -hmm. The young people, they can actually do that. Because if you look, f uh, for example, Chinoy University, University. Mm -hmm. yes, they have got a fully fledged department, which is the energy and 
boyfriend who has department and not uh, 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 the, 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 the actual name, but they've got a program. And the young people, the young engineers that are coming from Chinoy, they can actually tell you there's nothing important, that there's nothing serious in producing, it's mm -hmm. not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can actually produce those things. Mm -hmm. But what they need is financial backup for mm -hmm. them to tap into to, 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 to fully utilize those opportunities. Now, obviously, you mentioned the issue of skills. And, yes. uh, and I'm thinking, um, you know, renewable energy is also very much uh, centered around technology, yes. engineering, yes. Uh, electronics, civil. Um, and with the level of brain drain and the loss of, uh, you know, human resource that we have as a country, um, isn't there a critical shortage? How do we bridge this gap? Yeah, there is, a, there, there, there is a critical shortage because if you look at it at this point, uh, most of our young people who come from university, uh, just across the river down south, uh, there is uh, a lot of renumeration. Mm -hmm. And young people, they, like I said, the first thing young people think of is where is the money? Mm -hmm. But if this... Um, renewable energy sector is well funded, we can actually retain mm -hmm. most of the people that have gone outside to come back and invest in Zimbabwe and to come back with their skills, mm -hmm. back to invest their skills in Zimbabwe. With the current situation, most of the young people, we are losing a lot of young people, we are losing a lot of potential. They are going outside, they are going to for greener pastures in, uh, in the region and globally a lot of uh, technical skills in the renewable energy sector is scattered mm -hmm. globally from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. We're heading, uh, unfortunately, towards the end of our program, and um, I'll prob probably ask you guys to just give me your, your closing submissions uh, before we, we, we wrap it up. Uh, Amanda, I'll just give you a chance. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I was dying to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you, Blessing. Uh, I, I thank you for the platform to come and talk to you. But also I want to encourage each and every young people, young person out there to not, not to wait to be called to or to be summoned for opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's high time as young people we, we summon ourselves and break in within the system so that we can contribute. This is our country, all known and explanation in investing in this country. So I would like to accommodate each and every year. If you feel you're a green and you're a green ranger and you feel you can contribute to the to harness to to green energy in this country, it's the platform, it's the time. Just reach out to organizations such as EVOS, reach out within your community because it begins with you. Charity begins at home, it begins in our communities, in our diverse places. So I, I want to urge each and every young person to, to speak out, to stand up and say, okay, fine, I'm going to be a green energy. I won't stay at home and say I'm not employed. Let me employ myself and start doing something. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Phil? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I want the, the title of the program, Green is Gold. Yeah, for sure, Green is, uh, is Gold. Let's, uh, as young people, let's uh, invest in this, uh, in, in, in this green uh, growth and green initiatives. They give us a lot of uh, opportunities. I also appeal to all stakeholders, uh, the media, uh, the government, CSOs, uh, NGOs, to come and fund, invest in young people. They have got a lot of ideas. They are very innovative, they are creative. They can actually come up with uh, innovative ideas which can solve even the bigger problems that we are having of electricity. And uh, we can actually achieve our targets as a nation to reduce global emissions under the nationally determined co uh, contributions on climate change. Mm -hmm. I would also like to thank ZTN for this opportunity for us to come here and talk on behalf of the young people. Thank you so much. Uh, now, as we come to the end of our program, Green as Gold, brought to you by Hivos and uh, ZTN, I'd like to thank uh, my guest for today, Amanda Makombe, a green energy youth advocate. Uh, she was telling us that about the Green Rangers and uh, most certainly giving that invitation and a call for action to come on board and also Phil Mudaman, the programs officer at Action 24, an organization that believes in grassroots and uh, making people effective. And uh, many thanks also to our partner, Hivos, 
who made this program possible through their Green and Inclusive Energy Initiative, which seeks to help alleviate the energy poverty situation that is in Africa and, of course, in line with their belief in the unlimited potential of people, that's you and me. Today's program was the second in the ongoing series that focuses on the importance of Zimbabwe uh, transitioning to the use of renewable energy towards social and also economic development as well as opportunities arising for entrepreneurs and the marginalized during this critical transition to renewable energy. Now, reduce waste. If you can't, then reuse or better still, recycle. Go green, stay safe. I'm Blessing Munazi. See you next week.